Today, we begin a brand new sermon series that is entitled, For I Have Come. This is speaking from Jesus' point and his voice, For I Have Come. The purpose of this sermon series I have in mind is, is twofold. One, it's to prepare our hearts for the coming Christmas, right? Um, and, and, and helping us see through God's word why Jesus came. Um, and not just us kind of observing why he came, but really from Jesus' own words and his own mouth of why he said was the purpose of him coming. The second purpose is to prepare also the way for our focus in the coming new year, which will be a direction I'm really excited to share with you about for 2021. So this sermon series is going to kind of in some ways set the stage for that as we enter into the new year. So as I mentioned through these next few weeks up until Christmas, we're going to focus on why Jesus came from his home in heaven to earth and hearing from Jesus directly what his purpose was for coming to us. We're going to look at our series Bible quote, um, and we have also today's Bible quote, but we, we, we're going to look at the series Bible quote in John chapter 6, 38, and it reads this, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the core of Jesus' purpose for coming from heaven to us, which is not to do his own will, but to do his Father's will, his Father who sent him to us, the will of him who sent him. And so what we will see and what we will hear Jesus reveal about his purpose for coming to earth is a perfect reflection. Everything we hear and hear him say is a perfect reflection, a direct reflection of the Father's will and heart and what God wants us to know and also respond to accordingly, both as followers of Jesus Christ and, and for those who do not know Christ. So for us as followers of Christ, those who are disciples of Jesus, um, Jesus' purpose that he has stayed here on earth is also our purpose here on earth. The things that he has mentioned as our Lord and as our leader it is also the very things that we follow him after here on earth. So those are some of those points through this, this series that we're going to be touching on. What Jesus said about his purpose for coming and, and his mission here on earth, he has now given to us as his body, um, as his people, to continue that mission here on earth. Yeah? So that's kind of the intent of this sermon series. And today's message theme is entitled, Not Peace, But a Sword. So this is the first thing that we're going to be taking a look at this morning in terms of why Jesus said he came to earth um, and one of, one of his purposes here. And that's coming from Matthew chapter 10, 34, which is our Bible quote for today. And this is what Jesus said. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have a couple of questions as I was studying this, this text. Um, and and I'll, I'll share some of those questions with you because I believe we'll be able to touch on a few of them, and maybe they're similar questions that you have in your mind as you listen to what Jesus, Jesus just said. What did Jesus mean by this when he said he's not come to bring peace on earth, but, but a sword? And, and why is this important for us to hear? Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? then why does Jesus say he's not come to bring peace, but a sword? 
And then lastly, what does then this sword represent? What's the meaning of this sword? So these are some of the questions we'll be covering as we look at the latter half of Matthew chapter 10, which we're going to focus on this morning from verses 24 through 39. So if you have a Bible, feel free to open that up and and follow along because we'll be moving through that passage together. So what I want to start with, though, just to set this up, is how chapter 10 starts. And it begins with Jesus summoning his 12 disciples and then sending them out on mission to basically proclaim the kingdom of heaven to the lost sheep of Israel and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he instructs them to go and cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, and to do so, to go on this mission without preparing, making preparations and provisions for themselves, but instead to completely depend on the support and care of others they minister to. But Jesus warns them that this mission is not going to be all fun and and easy, that it's actually um, laid with many, many hardships and difficulties. He tells them clearly that he's sending them out as sheep among wolves and so that they will be mistreated they will be persecuted for his sake in fact he says that they will be hated by people because of his name i mean that's that's pretty pretty stark he's saying i've got a mission for you and this it's not only not going to be easy you're going to be hated because of what i'm going to send you out to do And then in verse 22, it says, it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. So he he sends them on a mission and he says, this is is the purpose of this. Go proclaim the gospel that the, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And while you do this, rely on the support of other people. Bless them as they bless you. If they don't, just, you know, go to the next place. Um, but as you do, you're going to get persecuted. And this is going to be very difficult. You're going to be hated because of, of this. And he says it is the one who endures to the end who will be saved. I, I want to kind of kind of pause here for a moment because I've, I've heard a lot of people get a little bit, a lot of brothers and sisters get a little bit confused about this text, thinking that it says something that it, it doesn't. So salvation, I want to make clear, because this is, this gospel message, salvation is not a reward of your endurance, okay? Salvation is not based off of you, your endurance level. Instead, endurance is the hallmark and a trait of those who are saved. There's a massive difference between those two, okay? Because salvation is is given to us as a gift of God's grace through our faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how we receive salvation. That's how we get salvation. That is how we are living in salvation. And those who have been saved, those who have actually received the glorious grace of God, what brings and manifests out of their life, one of the important traits is endurance until the very end. As we saw throughout the book of Revelation, those who belong to God, who are sealed of God, they were faithful unto even death, right? So endurance is not a reward that we get, or salvation is not a reward for the endurance. It is a It is a mark, it is a hallmark, if you will, of the Christian, of the the one who has been saved completely. And so we we, we see this um, fruit within those who've been saved. It, It is, there's evidence of it, of those who have been saved, those who've been saved by the grace of God. And we see all of these different fruit and evidences that come out of the believer 
because, not because of anything they can boast about, not because of anything they can do, because, but simply because God's grace and his spirit and his love and all that he is, his whole presence, lives and dwells and works through us. Yeah. And so those of us with the spirit of God dwelling in us have God's spirit because we surrendered our whole life over to Jesus because we trusted him as our savior and Lord of our life. Well, so when it says that Jesus is the prince of peace, yes, that's true. The Bible prophesied that Jesus will be coming as a prince of peace. And Jesus even speaks about bringing peace here on earth. But he came not to bring an earthly peace. Okay? Because earthly peace, this worldly peace, is defined by an absence of trouble, an absence of of conflict. That's how the world defines peace. But Jesus came not to eliminate earthly conflict and earthly troubles in this world, but to bring the most important peace, which is peace between us and God. That's the peace that we need the most. The Bible tells us, Romans 5 tells us, that without Jesus, we are enemies of God, that we are hostile to God. But Jesus came to reconcile us to God through his death. So this is not an earthly peace. It is peace with God that Jesus came to accomplish for us. A, a peace that we cannot have with God. We remain hostile and enemies with God without Jesus and his work on the cross and through his resurrection, through that, of what he's accomplished in our faith in him is what brings us peace with God. And as we have peace with God, we have the peace of God. As we, this peace of God that the Bible says passes every understanding because no matter what's happening here on earth, the chaos that happens here on earth, the, the complete effects of sin that we experience on a day-to-day -day level here on earth, despite that, in the midst of that, we have this peace of God because we have peace with him. That's the peace that comes by Jesus, the Prince of Peace, as we have peace with God through what Jesus did for us. But this peace, ironically, does not come without some great cost and even some great conflict. And this is where we're getting to about what Jesus said about the sword. This is what the sword that Jesus speaks of means, that this peace that Jesus comes to bring, not everyone is going to be thrilled about it. They're not going to be happy about it. In fact, many will not accept it and they will reject it and they may even reject it in a hostile fashion. It is in some ways offensive to many people because what this peace requires is what we'll be seeing here in our next points here is 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 a complete surrendering of our life to Jesus it's an admittance that we don't got it all right in fact we're in great and desperate need of a savior and so it will bring a sharp division between those who fear God and those who do not fear God. Instead, they fear other things like people. And so here's our first point today, if you're following along in our notes. This sword that Jesus speaks of exposes who we truly fear and worship. Let's start in verse 24. I'm going to 
move a little bit before the, the, the verses in your notes here. And we'll have those on the slides. Verse 24, Matthew chapter 10. A disciple is not above his teacher, this is Jesus speaking, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he may become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house, and his, that's Jesus, the master of the house, Beelzebul, meaning Jesus was in, la- in league with Satan, that's what Be- Beelzebul means, how much more will they insult the members of his household. So Jesus is using this metaphor of the master of the house, the head of the house being himself. He was called in cooperation with the devil, and that's how he's doing all his miraculous works. If that's what he is being insulted with, how much more will they then insult his own disciples? In other words, if Jesus the master is insulted and despised, so too will his disciples be mistreated in similar or even worse ways. The disciple is not greater than the teacher, nor a slave and servant, his, his master. We've got to remember that. Okay? We've got to remember that as followers of Jesus Christ. We're not greater than our master, Jesus Christ. Christ. So Jesus repeats this again and again to those to, to not fear those who are trying to bring them harm as Jesus has sent them on mission. He says, yeah, this is, I'm warning you, this is going to happen, but do not fear them, but fear God. Those who will try to bring harm to you through their words and even to your own body Don't fear them, but instead fear God. Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 through 27. So do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather... Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So yes, people can bring natural destruction in our lives. They can make our life incredibly miserable. Especially if there's an authority of power over us that we we, we have very little control over. But no matter how miserable and no matter how painful those experiences are, no matter how devastating those maltreatment might be, it is still temporary. No matter how painful, it is still temporary. God, however, brings judgment that is everlasting. It's forever. And the Bible makes absolutely clear anyone who is without Christ is an enemy of God. And he will judge people rightly and righteously and eternally and forevermore based off of that reality. So do you fear God? Or do you fear people more than God? The sword that Jesus came to bring, it will expose who we truly fear and revere in our life, who we hold in the greatest esteem in our life, and who we deem as worthy of our very life. Is it God who judges your eternal destiny, or is it men and women in this world who may have the power to make your earthly life miserable, but they will all face the same judgment, everlasting judgment by God who is eternal. This is what Jesus concludes. I'm going to skip a few verses here just to carry this theme. Um, 
Matthew chapter 10, 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before people, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before people, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. You know, through this entire year, God has just been bringing such um, wonderful discipling in my own life through his word to learn from the whole counsel of God's word. It's one of the biggest blessings about teaching his word is that you, you must wrestle with the whole of what God says and, and, and allow him to teach you. And this has been growing, if not weighing on my heart, and I have been impressed on my heart to say this to us who are listening, that there are some of us out here who, who are listening to the sermon, who go to church, who um, grew up as, as a Christian or have given our lives to, to Jesus as, as, as if by hearing the gospel. But there are some of you who may have given your life to the wrong gospel. I really believe this. I believe also this is the main reason that there are still many who profess to be Christians, to be followers of Jesus Christ, but then actually deny Jesus before people. That when it comes to it, they fear people more than they fear God. So let me be very clear what I mean by the wrong gospel. The gospel is not, I repeat, the gospel is not about life improvement or life enhancement. Okay? The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about giving you happiness, earthly peace, and prosperity here on earth. It's not a spiritual product that you, you see and you hear about for you to try and to see if Christianity fits for you and to give it a shot and to see if it actually brings you the improved quality of life that you've been looking for. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's what you thought the gospel was about, then you were not given, you were not, yeah, told the true gospel. Because here's the loving truth. The gospel is not about you. The gospel is all about Jesus Christ. If this is the gospel that a person responds to, the moment then things here on earth gets difficult and troublesome. And Jesus said, that's going to exactly happen, that in this world you will have trouble and trials and tribulation. That moment, you don't get what you want out of this earthly life will also be the moment you believe that Christianity has failed you. And you will then slowly, gradually, or quickly, it doesn't matter when, eventually go off and find something else that promises you the life that you want. This is a false understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will lead people to deny Jesus before men. This is not a mark of the saved. So brothers and sisters, we who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm really convicted of this, we must never even hint at this kind of message when we share Jesus' gospel. And we can't be timid to help people see that they stand guilty and condemned before a holy God in their sin. 
And God will be one day judging them righteously for their guilt. Condemned. And the punishment for that is everlasting separation from God that the Bible calls hell. We can't be timid. We cannot be, we can't shrink back in telling people this truth. We, we'll see throughout the rest of the message today how that is so important, preparing the hearts of people. I mean, one of the reasons I want to share in this, this sermon series of what Jesus came to do is exactly what our, his purpose on earth is our purpose on earth, is that we, he told us to go. And, and, and this is, I'm talking to myself and, and sharing from my own personal experience. My, my experience with doing evangelism that is very relationship-based, which is good. Build those loving relationships. But if you don't, if you are too timid to let God work through you to tell people the truth, that they are lost in their sin, that they stand guilty and condemned before a holy God, and they're going to be judged righteously for that one day, the gift of God's grace is going to be nothing to them. In fact, then the only alternative that we have to offer in sharing the gospel is, again, some kind of message of life improvement and life enhancement. You'll have peace. You'll have fulfillment. You you will have a sense of happiness or or contentment or or things are going to be better for you spiritually. And that, I believe, is what produces believers or or converts that will eventually try it on to see if that really happens but then realize this life is full of trouble full of tribulation and they will deny Jesus before men you see there's no reason for repentance when the gospel is only about life enhancement and life improvement. There's no reason for true repentance because what a person gives their life to in this case is more of a self-improvement program and not to Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? The gospel means good news and it is good news only to those who know that they stand absolutely helpless, powerless, and condemned in their sin against a holy God, deserving of his wrath and of hell. That's the only way that the grace of God becomes something of of any value and worth because for this person if you are a a believer you will remember that day where God saved you where you heard the gospel that you are headed and destined to hell and this is absolute there's nothing you can do about it but Jesus did you couldn't do anything about it but Jesus did that he that he died for you That instead of you having to suffer the wrath of God, Jesus did that for you. And instead of hanging on the cross condemned, he was hung on the cross and died condemned. That he took our place, that he he made that way for us. And so the good news is to accept and take that and with a glorious joy, a desperation of, of clinging to Jesus as our Savior and joyfully giving to Him the whole of our life. That's salvation. Hanung's over here doing the, the helping with the live stream. If, if I told him that I was going to pay for his one million one speeding ticket and told him that I just did that for him today. He'd be like, 
um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't, I don't know why you did that because I really didn't have a speeding ticket. I, no, I'm not aware of anything that I did wrong, but if you say so, that's, that's great. But if we helped them understand or helped any one of us understand that we actually broke a law that made us guilty of the very um, the consequence that the law requires, which is a fine of that amount. Going through, say, for example, a, 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 one of those speeding zones that are meant for schools, right? You fly pa past there going, what, say, 100 kilometers per hour. You get caught over that. If you know you're guilty, that fine makes sense. And then somebody steps in to actually pay that for you. Well, that, that's a totally different attitude. And I think this is the best illustration I'm coming up with right now. But in a sense, sometimes when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ without helping people, let the Spirit of God convict them of their sin, they have no reason. They have no really, really reason to accept and, and fully understand what salvation is about. True repentance happens only with the true gospel. A few chapters before Jesus said that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is what I implore you as you're listening to this, if the Holy Spirit is helping you realize that you've given your life to a gospel that wasn't the true gospel, I say this with love. Repent. Turn away from that. Turn away from that gospel that promises life enhancement, improvements, prosperity, peace, because that, that is not the gospel that saves Seek to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ and it will have nothing to do with improving your self-life but everything to do with giving up your life to Jesus Christ. That moment and only that moment and only through that do we become a follower and true disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said a disciple is not above his teacher a servant not greater than his master. And because Jesus suffered to bring his life to people, we also will go through hardships and suffer as we follow Jesus to bring God's life to people as well. But Jesus says again and again, do not fear people. Fear only God. Jesus came to bring a sword and this sword will reveal who we truly fear. And it will separate those who fear men from those who fear God. And, point number two, this sword divides all of our prior allegiances. Matthew 10, 34-37, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's Enemies will be the members of his household. The one who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. Those are very hard words. Especially, I would say, in cultures where family relationships are extremely important, if not the most important. And the reason Jesus will divide even family relationships is because, listen to this, idolatry is at the heart of sinful man. 
from the very beginning, since Adam and Eve disobeyed God and rejected him as their all-sufficient one, idolatry became central to human life. Idolatry is basically looking to that which is created rather than the creator for life. And since the fall of humanity, it has been idolatry, has been second nature to our whole existence, our whole experience uh, as a human being. And so if we don't break away from these idolatrous loyalties, Jesus cannot be Lord in our life. We will inevitably, inevitably obey men rather than God. In Genesis 3.16, speaking of Adam and Eve, after they sinned, God said to Eve, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. This is the effects of the curse on, um, on the whole of the world in human relationships because sin came into the world. That our desires will be for one another. We, instead of looking to God for life, we look to one another. But then there's this conflict of those who we desire to want to control us. And that is the epitome of what Jesus is bringing here on earth when he came to bring division for because our loyalty, he call, he's calling us to a new kind of allegiance, a loyalty that is absolutely to him and him alone. And so the very first commands that God gives to his people is this, Exodus 20, 3, 4, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or in any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Jesus is calling us when he came. He said, I'm not bringing this harmony here on earth, this earthly peace where it's an absence of, of human conflict. That's not the peace that I'm bringing, but a sword that will call people to absolute and total loyalty to him and to him alone, to restore what a human relationship looks like with God, that our whole dependency, our whole allegiance, our whole f- the, what we fear above all is the Lord Almighty. We use a term in family therapy to describe one, one kind of um, area of unhealthy family dynamics. And that term is called enmeshment or being enmeshed. It basically means that two people have become so emotionally fused together that each person's sense of worth, their sense of security, their per- sense of being and even and, 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 and well-being is completely dependent on one another. That's what, at least in a secular term, is trying to describe when two people have become way too important to each other. And even this world understands that this, is, this brings unhealth. It brings a sense of dysfunction within human relationships, and it's really what the Bible says is idolatry. It is unhealthy for the human soul, where our reverence of family goes above our reverence of God. That's not how it's meant to be. But cultures across the world, though maybe theoretically, maybe some say their allegiance is to God, really put family above God. And so it's not uncommon in our world to, today for parents to be idols, for children to be idols, for our family bonds to be idols. 
and set above God. So Jesus brings a sword that will cause a dividing line between all of our prior allegiances and call us to total loyalty to him, to have no other gods before him. And as you can probably imagine or probably have experienced, I know some, if not many of you, have experienced this, this kind of calling of allegiance and loyalty to Jesus will bring with it great conflict, even within households, as people and idols are dethroned from the high places of their loved one's lives. And then there are clear spiritual lines drawn. So Jesus is saying if family loyalty requires denying or turning away from Jesus as Lord, we as Christians must be ready to love Jesus more than family by remaining true and faithful to him above all, even our family relationships. Jesus tells us this truth with such great love. And he is helping us understand that yes, this may bring natural conflict, but this kind of division is necessary. The sword is necessary in order to bring true eternal peace to those lives and people that we love who are still lost in sin. Not only, like I said, this restore our relationship of what it looks like between a human being and, and God is to look like, but until Jesus has our complete and absolute loyalty, my dear friends, until he has that, he cannot work through us, through our obedience, because that's how God works through us, is through our obedience. Well, he cannot do that to bring his life of salvation to those around us because in the end, we are more concerned with preserving our own self instead of giving up ourself for the lives of those who are perishing. And this is bringing us to our third and final point for today. This sword requires the willing death of self. Matthew chapter 10, we read 38 and 39. And the one who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one who has found his life will lose it. And the one who has lost his life on my account will find it. This is a wa- act of the will. It's a willing act for those of you who have never given your allegiance to Jesus. Let me say this. A willing death means that you choose to no longer be the master of your own life. Now, this is why this is so offensive. The message of the cross is foolishness, the Bible says, to those who are perishing. But this is what a willing death looks like, is that you make a choice to no longer be the master of your own life. Instead, you choose for this old master that the Bible calls the old self to be killed, to be crucified with Jesus Christ, to die with him on the cross so that Jesus can be your new master and Lord of your life. That means your life is no longer yours. You've given it. You've surrendered the whole of your life to Jesus. It belongs to him. He's the master. He's the Lord of your life. That is what it means for a person to take up his cross and follow Jesus. For the believer, it's exactly the same, except there is one slight but also important difference of what it means to take up our cross every single day and follow Jesus. Because Paul has already told us that us as Christians who, who have transferred a trust to Jesus and his work of salvation for us, we simply consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in 
Christ Jesus, Romans 6, 11. Assuming that you've already made that decision to crucify your old self with Christ to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, how we take up our cross every single day is that we consider that we are dead to sin is a reality. Alive to God as a reality. So as the accusations come, as, as the enemy tries to, to convince you otherwise, taking up your cross is not trying to die to yourself because you can't do that. If you, if you could die to yourself, there's no one in the Bible says to, to die to yourself. I know that sounds incorrect, but look. There's nothing that says to die to yourself. If we can die to ourselves, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die. Okay? So if dying to ourselves brings us salvation, there's no reason for Jesus to die. We can't do that. But we, Jesus died for us so that our old self can be crucified with him, to be buried in, in baptism with him, and so that we can be alive to Jesus Christ. So if, that's the, if that is what you've believed in, if that is your place of, of salvation, then consider and count yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, the cross is God's sword on earth. When you take up your cross, we're standing on the amazing accomplishment that your old sinful self is dead. It's buried. That it's been crucified with Christ and buried with Him. And that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we also were brought to life, to brand new life, and made in His likeness of His resurrected life. The effect of the cross is like a sword. And as you stand on this truth, as you consider this every single day and you count yourself dead to sin and alive to God, that work of the cross, like a sword, will penetrate deeper and deeper into your heart and into your soul and, and bring about the life-giving work of Jesus' death in and through you. It's what Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. That reality, I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer that I who live any longer, but Christ who lives in me. That's the life-giving work of the cross. As we take up our cross and we follow Jesus, It's not about trying to kill yourself or die to yourself. It's just putting complete faith and trust that what Jesus did has done. It's finished. It's complete. No matter what the enemy says, no matter what anyone else says, no matter what your experience says, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Jesus Christ. I'm going to end with this story in Mark chapter 10. It's the story of the, of the rich young ruler, or the young man who came to Jesus to ask him how he can inherit, inherit uh, eternal life. In verse 17, Mark 10, he says, As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do so that I may inherit eternal life? But Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus corrects this man's very shallow, I would say even warped understanding of good because he calls Jesus good according to a worldly definition of good, according to a worldly standard of good, believing he himself, we'll see a little bit later, he himself is a good man addressing another good man. But Jesus points out and points the man to the real standard of good, 
No one is good except God alone. Jesus then points him to the Ten Commandments, highlights five of them, and he says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And, and this is what the young man said to him. Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. And that's when, so you, you here, catch the flow of this. This, this, this man is interested in heaven. He's interested in eternal life. He comes up and he kneels before Jesus to really get the answer. And Jesus is addressing what he believe, he thinks is good. His self-righteousness, if you will. That comes to the surface. He, he explains that, yeah, I've, I've done all these things. Even since I was young, I've kept all of them. Then Jesus points to him the essence of the commandments of Command number one, number two, which has to do with to have no other gods before him, to worship no one else but God alone. Looking at him, verse 21, Jesus showed love to him. I love that part. Jesus showed love to him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But he was deep, deeply dismayed by these words and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. This is what the sword does. It exposes what we truly worship and revere in our life. And it will draw a clear line between Jesus and every other allegiance and loyalty we have. To say, are you willing to make Jesus your Lord and Savior? So there will be grief, just as this man walked away with great grief. Because the gospel demands a willing death. But the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, tells us that this is a godly grief that produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Yeah? So Christians, let's take note of how Jesus led people to eternal life. Especially those, and this is going to be the most of the case, especially those who consider themselves in their own definition as a good person. That live according to their own self-righteousness, according to their own understanding of good that they've done enough that God should let them into heaven because they're basically a good person. They compare themselves to everyone else, to the worst in this world and says, yeah, I'm not like them. So I'm a good person. Jesus attacks this definition of good. He shows love by pointing people to God as the perfect standard to which we must compare ourselves to not to the next person, not, not to the next evil doer, not to our own standard or the worldly standard that people measure themselves by, but God's standard. And Jesus lets the power of God's standard, his law to bring knowledge of sin into this young man's heart. Romans 3.20 says that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And that's the purpose of God's standard, of what he's, he puts out there as his law. It's, it's not, it can never save any person. The purpose is to condemn. It will never be able to save. To, no one's going to be able to keep him. But Galatians 3 tells us that it's like a tutor that leads us to Christ so that we can be saved and justified by faith. So Jesus came not to bring earthly peace, but a sword, and a sword that will bring to light who and what has our ultimate worship and draw a clear dividing line between those things and Jesus Christ. And he says, those who do not 
take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one who has found his life will lose it. And the one who has lost his life on my account will find it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all about Jesus. It's about him. What he's accomplished for you. You reap all the benefits of it. But it's not about you. The center is not you. It's not your life. It's his It's not your works. It's his work. Your trust in that. Your surrender to that. Your giving up your life to him is what brings us into the worthiness of a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, question is, will you take up your cross and follow Jesus? I have a few discussion and prayer points for you as you meet in your gatherings or there in your home or perhaps if you're on your own and you want to take these into conversation with God, please do that. One, why is this message important for Christians? of Jesus' purpose, that he came not to bring earthly peace, but a sword. Second, why is this message important for sinners? And third, as we enter into the Christmas season, pray that God works in the hearts of sinners to receive Jesus and believers to share the gospel fearlessly. Let me pray for us as we take some of those and meditate on that and get ready to to pray together, to discuss these things together. We'll close this part of the service today. Jesus, I pray, Father, that by your Spirit you will continue to open the eyes of our heart to see your word as you intend for us to see it. And I pray right now for those who, Lord, you are helping by your spirit to identify if they have responded, heard and responded to not the true gospel and that they will know it with such clarity that they can then choose to turn away from that and to you to give up the whole of their life to you. I pray for you, my friend, who you're listening and you've never given your allegiance, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Is the Holy Spirit working in your heart and telling and showing you what is true? Is he convicting you of your sin? Is he convicting you that you will stand in judgment one day and hell is the punishment? If so, then he has his son, Jesus Christ, who he sent into this world for you, to die for you, to take away your sins so that you can have his eternal life. If that is, this message is something that is growing in your heart to to respond to and, and you want to receive him, simply do that. There's no magical way of praying. There's no formal thing that you need to say. It's just simply crying out to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I am a sinner and I, I need you and I accept you to be my savior. I need to be saved and I thank you for showing me the truth. And so I give to you my sinful life and I receive your gift of eternal life. And just let the Spirit of God 
bring you out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom, his kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we'd love to hear from you if you made this decision. God, I pray that, Lord, you will continue to help us as a body of believers to go fearlessly and and share the gospel with those who are perishing within our homes and outside of our homes, in our workplace and all around us. Father, just being lovingly, telling people the truth and letting the word of God do its powerful effect in people to bring people into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Equip us, Lord. Send us, mobilize us. And Father, we pray for a revival in this world to where God, you are Lord in people's lives. We love you in Jesus we pray, amen. Okay, we'll close today's service. Um, and as we end, we'll put up the, the information for our tithes and offering. Um, right now we're taking that by bank transfer and love for us to join in together in worshiping God this way of giving to him the very wonderful things that he's already imparted to us. Not simply as a, as a, as a need to, to do it out of compulsion, but knowing that God has given you the responsibility to be a steward of his kingdom and that we give to him with an act of great cheer and thankfulness to him. So we'll put that up for you and God bless you. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next week.